Are you with us? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I feel like I'm running a seance. Are you with us? <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, over to you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for taking your time. Um, my name is Simon Walker. I'm a resident at uh, Brentail Farm, Mangawai Heads. And I just want to have a brief chat today really about the Celium Network, which is made by Encounter Solutions. Uh, that's headed by Simon Croft in Auckland. Um, and in the first slide, you'll see there the uh, Acelium node, which is the, the white plastic box with the aerial, um, on a DOC200 trap. And the Celium node is literally the field component of what we sort of overarchingly call the Celium network. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's just a quick um, overview of the trapping network at Bremtail Farm, which is sort of there in, in the map. Uh, consists of a mainly DOC 200s, double sets, um, some DOC 250s, about seven or eight at the moment, um, strategically placed sort of along the border um, and around the area in the middle of the, the block where Kiwi were heard and validated last year, and, and we heard one last, a female last night in the middle of the block out listening. Um, also SA2s uh, and live capture cat traps made by cat, uh, Trap Works, which are a, a really good um, cat trap. So there's about 45 traps with nodes deployed on Brentail Farm. Okay, next slide. So what I'm going to do today is just cover what is the Celia network, which is sort of uh, will be in the in the next slide and a bit of what I've already said and, and some early results on what we saw in our trapping and a bit of sort of anecdotal um, discussion, and then a, a recommendation on how to get the best benefit really out of out of the system. So the two graphics there on the right. Um, Firstly, the Celium base station, which is the long pole on the left of the solar panel. And that's deployed at a high point uh, in a project. And uh, it's the station at all the Celium nodes, which is the second graphic on the right there, the, the box with the aerial. All those nodes connect to that base station. And then that base station in turn connects to the internet via a cell phone or a, a satellite network. Uh, next slide, please. So that's a bit of a graphical overview from Encounter Solutions. It shows the data flow. Uh, so essentially on the left in the red there, you have various nodes in the field. And so pest traps, uh, wildlife monitoring or climate stations, a variety of different applications. Um, the nodes in the field then talk to the base station. So they use a very, uh, uh, basically the same frequency as Kiwi, um, directional Kiwi finding um, radio signal, so it, it hugs contours essentially, and so it can uh, when the traps are deep in the bush, they can easily find their way back to the base station or communicate. And so the base station then talks to the internet and cloud-based service. So real-time notifications end up uh, passing through that system, and then back to the end user via email or um, uh, SMS notification if it's been set up that way. And so the photo on the right uh, shows the solar powered base station, uh, the size of it, its antenna, and, and in this case, the guys from Encounter Solutions have been installing it down south. So, next slide, please, Dal. So, the idea for the Celium network is real time monitoring of trap status. And so, that is uh, a kill trap. Uh, and what and live capture traps. So for a kill trap, you know, has there been a triggering event that's signaled a vibration and that vibration has been sensed? Or with a live capture trap, what is the status of the gate? Is it up, is it down? And there are sort of two modes. Uh, so vibration mode, 
uh, sense the shock of a DOC200 triggering or magnet mode that detects the presence or not of a magnet close to the node. Um, and it's the latter one that I find very uh, useful because that reduces the need for you know, human visits to live capture traps that are set, that are still set with the gate open. So if we know that the gate's open through binary, the magnet's there or it's not there. If it's there, the gate's open. If it's not, it's, it's closed and the trap needs to be visited. So both modes sort of reduce the human presence that's likely to deter animals. Uh, particularly a reduction of labor visiting traps within the 12 hours of daylight required by law. So in that particular example there, you see uh, some nodes on a live capture uh, on a DOC 250 and then on a, a Tim's trap as well. Um, I have them on SA2s and uh, DOC 200s and variety. Um, next slide. So, how have I found the system to be a benefit? Um, okay, I live here and I can go and service these traps uh, when they trigger or when they need to. So I get a message from a trap, a DOC 200. Uh, I go to it and the trap is cleaned and it's reset. So the animal is still you know, fresh, sometimes not even ridden mortis, definitely not maggoty and rotting. Uh, so the trap is immediately reset. And so the killing productivity is higher. Um, as an example, um, uh, on Breamtail, you know, I'd been out in the morning at about 10 a.m. Uh, I'd uh, reset or relured the network. And then one particular trap triggered only about half an hour later after put lure in it. And so I went back about 10, 30, 11 a.m. and it was a stoat. Um, so I immediately collected it, reset that trap. Uh, that night, another stoat was caught. I went back the following morning, uh, reset it. And that second night, a third stoat was caught all in the same trap. So just happened to have that box next door to what was obviously a den and at a time of the year when they were coming out. And so typically that trap would have been out of action from the day of servicing with that first hit within 30 minutes until the day of next servicing, you know, so 20 something days later. Um, secondly, because I was attending the traps after triggering, I was getting an understanding of the data of when the triggers were occurring. So with fresh lure, uh, you know, that little chart there shows that um, you know, night one after relure, there were five rats caught. You know, night two, they were, they, they, they were the traps were reset. Night two, there was four. Uh, night three, two, and then dropped away night four, nothing. And then over the remainder of that 20 day period, then only one more was caught in that particular example. So it's sort of leading us to the decision that, um, you know, obviously these, these traps were triggering with fresh lure in the first few nights. So what we decided to do is during our mustard season, we dropped the, the servicing down from every 20 something days to every eight days across October to March during mustard season. Thirdly, it's sort of, you know, servicing traps is more productive because it's only lure replacement. Um, I'm not cleaning uh, rotting animals. So I found that, you know, doing the, the network service was um, a lot faster for me and I could be a little bit more prepared and that I wasn't going to have to go out and clean as well as do service. Um, but the benefit of that is that I live on site and so I have the time to do that. Um, so the next slide, please. Where I think uh, the Celia network is, is most valuable is with live capture trapping. I think that that'll be that where you can see the greatest impact is in the reduction of labor for servicing cap, you know, live capture traps. And so this can essentially move to more live capture traps being available in the field to be serviced by individuals. So by that, I mean, um, I program the nodes to talk back to the system and send its state every four hours. So, and that, and those messages are recorded and audited and kept. And so I can see the status of the trap. I can see whether it's gates up or it's gates down and that data is kept and sent back every four hours. So if 
the live capture trap gate closes, then the trigger message is sent, and then that you know it's needs to be serviced. And then every four hours after that, it's saying the gate's down, the gate's down, the gate's down. So I know that you know it needs to be serviced and it hasn't been serviced, and it can come back up. So the benefit of this is that you know those gates are often up, not normally down. So instead of having to go in within the 12 hours of daylight check these things and spread your scent around in, in areas where animals aren't expecting humans, then that remote monitoring um, enables that to sort of comply with the law. It's a very binary situation. The magnet's there or it's not there. Um, the gate's up or the gate's down. So where that can be scaled up is if one person is, is monitoring the status of that network and you have a bunch of volunteers under them that are responsible for individual live capture traps, then uh, those individuals uh, can be notified uh, when that trap triggers or they're likewise notified that they do not need to service that trap because it's up and the gate is open. And so that's sort of scaling up across a volunteer basis, I believe, is where the the benefit of the system will truly lie because um, especially targeting uh, you know, pests like cats and you also get anything else that manages to wander into that trap. So it's this auditability that I think is the key aspect of the Celian network um, and that it can be used to disperse a live capture trapping network amongst volunteers. And I think that's the way that will scale the benefit of, of this network. Okay, next slide. Okay, that's just a thank you. Thank you. Court answering, uh, court eating a jelly bean. Very nice. Okay, that was really good, Simon. And um, just wondering, Andy, did you see any good questions coming up through there, through the chat or the question and answer feature that some people are using? The obvious question that's come up uh, is the cost of such a system. Are you able to talk on that one, Simon? Yeah, I, believe, I, can, I can talk to the cost of, of the system. Um, I believe a plain vanilla system where, uh, firstly, two things. There may be one already in situ in, in, in the areas, particularly in Northland, because this has been um, sponsored or, or uh, put in place by NRC. So the equipment uh, is already in place within uh, a bunch of areas. But if, if there was not equipment in place, and I believe the cost of the bait station can run between three and a half to 4,000, uh, that goes in. Then I think each node uh, hardware cost is around 100, 130 or $140 or something like that. Um, costs at the moment are a bit variable because I, I did ask uh, the manufacturer, Simon Croft, recently, but they're, you know, even they're suffering from sort of supply chain issues. But those costs were sort of indicative of what he was um, telling me a, a vanilla, plain vanilla new system would cost. And then there's a maintenance fee that runs alongside of that, which would be, I think, a, a dollar a node or, or something like that alongside of it. Um, importantly, in Northland, I guess we're lucky in that the NRC has been using the system and uh, we have bait stations in place, or, sorry, base stations in place already. And nodes connecting to base stations are pretty much unlimited. So um, these things have, can have a coverage of, I think, you know, 80 kilometers max, or just depending on topography, probably a little bit less than that to be, um, to be workable. And then sort of an unlimited number of nodes going in. So in a nutshell, that's about the cost. I've got another couple of questions that have come in is, uh, one's a fairly broad question, installation difficulties, and also the potential for monitoring Kiwi. Uh, the latter, I'll let you make a comment on the latter. That's not my uh, area of expertise, um, although I don't think a Kiwi would like to drag around one of these monitors. But um, installation ease, well, uh, on a DOC 250, the a DOC 200 there, it's just a matter of um, screwing it on and um, 
uh, setting it up with a bit of programming, which is just a button interface. Um, uh, that's, that can be done by someone that knows what they're doing. And then the firmware was recently updated so that you could run a magnet along the bottom and just reset the, the node. So if you're cleaning the trap, uh, you wanted to reset it, run a magnet along and it's done. Um, for live captures, then the Trapworks uh, cage I've found already has a base plate in place and a, and a magnet um, holder uh, welded on. And I just fit them straight on with a couple of screws. What was that? Yeah, as for the Kiwi monitoring, we tried working with Encounter Solutions on this um, years ago. Um, and there was even a proposal which um, we accepted and, and wanted to progress. But then, to be fair, uh, they, they did get very busy with a lot of the predator-free type work and um, it, it never got progressed. Um, I would love the idea of a Kiwi wearing a transmitter walking past a trap box fitted with a Celium device with a node and for the node you have to tell me, hey, Jim Bob the Kiwi just walked past trap 52 and we'd all go, well, what's he doing there? Um, it would be really good. We, we were never able to progress that, even though Simon from Encounter Solutions um, did say that the transmitters would talk to his nodes. It would probably be a case of how how quick, how close would the Kiwi need to get to that node, like pretty much might need to do a barcode sort of swipe his leg across the node to get it to work initially. So um, interestingly, the major um, drawback to that progressing was uh, his recognition that Kiwi transmitters are 20 year old technology. And even though they're working fine, he wanted to upgrade those first before working with the node. And that would cause all sorts of um, interesting uh, connections through the Kiwi world, let me tell you. So um, that's as far as we got with that. Certainly interested to pick that up again. I'm thinking maybe Kiwis for Kiwi uh, are in discussions with Encounter Solutions, so maybe they'll make more progress um, than, than we did. Um, any final 